Today we're going to talk about uh, how young is too young and go over several things. Uh, the first being um, weight training. Uh, I, get, I get a decent number of questions, especially at the beginning of the uh, summer when everybody's going to go and do these strength and conditioning camps that they do in all the high schools and even junior highs these days. Um, you know, hey, should my kid even be doing that? And uh, then we're going to talk about a little bit about distance running and other training regimens that uh, is, are popular these days. And uh, finish off with a little bit on overtraining and burnout. A couple of things. First, is just remember, remind ourselves that, you know, kids are just physiologically and psychologically different than adults. And especially our younger school age athletes, they're going to be different than the high school kid. You know, the high school kid might tolerate getting yelled and screamed at by their football coach, but I mean, I don't know if anybody ever been to a flag football game and you got, you know, seven year olds running around. Uh, sometimes they're still getting yelled and screamed at and, and cussed at as, as disturbing as it is, um, which they don't, we, we can't do that for these kids. And you always have to counsel patients that, you know, if they make sure they know, know that coach and they, they know that they're get, putting their kid into a good environment when they're getting into that. Lack of skeletal maturity, so I always tell people if I'm going to, you know, a lot of times for overuse injuries, if I'm going to x-ray one side, I'll x-ray the other side too. To growth plates um, can look all sorts of different ways, especially for elbows and things like that. You know, kids have just, you know, less lean muscle mass and they're very hypermobile, especially once again our smaller kids, those school age kids. Growth spurts also can increase the risk of growth plate injuries. So, you know, how many kids do we see with Oscar Schlatter and Sievers and whatnot? And it's always after you know, they've shot up another inch and then now they're all tight again and they're irritating everything and then they're still out there trying to play soccer and soccer cleats that have no padding. And um, also, once again, we'll talk a little bit more about flexibility. So there is a st slow, steady decline of flexibility until puberty. So your, you know, your five-year-old's gonna be really flexible, but your 15-year-old, not so much, um, which sometimes can be a good thing for those really really flexible kids um, to, to be a little bit more stable. And uh, oftentimes stability is more of an issue than just brute strength in these kids. Overuse injuries, one uh, caveat of flexibility is it's not all about just stretching, you know, because you're gonna see, we see overuse injuries in really hypermobile kids and also really um, tight, inflexible kids. So really when you're starting a training program or you're gonna join a sport or anything, I always tell, tell people, you know, you have to kind of have a, have a goal. I mean, the goal can be just to have fun and hang out with my friends. That's completely okay. But you kind of have to feel like, well, what am I getting out of this? You know, um, am I want to be? Am I going to start doing this strength and conditioning program to be stronger, to be faster, to be quicker, or do I want to just join the summer swim team because my next door neighbor, who's my same age, is doing that? And why not? It seems like it seems like something cool to do in the summer. Um, and also this last thing, those kids with diabetes and asthma and other things, that's where you guys are, are really uh, important in coming in as far as like maximizing that uh, to make sure they're not going to be in harm's way when they do start that uh, training program. Um, and sometimes, that in, especially in the case of diabetes, those complicated diabetics that may involve, you know, hey, touch base with your endocrinologist and tell them you're going to be doing this. They might need to adjust your insulin, you know, schedule, things like that. Other things, I always tell remind people, you know, you gotta crawl before you can walk. You know, don't not everybody's gonna go and start dunking a basketball. They're not gonna start shooting three pointers if they've never even dribbled before. So a lot of these kids, and the same thing goes with strength and conditioning training too. You know, some of these kids, especially the younger age ones, really I feel like should be learning a lot more agility and coordination stuff too. And also just even just learning the rules of your sport. You know, I mean, everybody's been to those, if, if you have little kids who play sports, you've been to those games where the kid, you know, kicks the ball in the wrong goal or they're running the wrong way with the football or something, and it's, you know, and that happens, and it's all part of the, part of the learning curve, and that's okay. The last thing is really important, too, so especially for the weight room where you're around dangerous machines or potentially dangerous machines or equipment, you have to make sure they're old enough to follow instruction. Um, you know, if they're going to be in there and they're not really listening to the coach, they're out there, you know, in la-la land, it's probably not, you know, daydreaming, it's probably not super safe to put them around heavy equipment that's in motion. There's a lot of myths about resistance training and uh, one of them is the big ones, you know, oh, they're going to harm bones, they're going to harm growth plates and things like that. And uh, it's never really been shown to harm growth plates if it's done correctly. And once again, you have to put emphasis on done correctly. And also, you know, oh, it's doc, it's, well, it's, it might stunt their growth. What about, what about if they get injured? You know, I think, you know, my, my husband, I always hear, you know, from, from moms, my husband wants him to start lifting weights and the kid's like, you know, nine. And I don't think he's old enough. And, or the kid, sometimes the kid's like 14. And my husband wants him to start lifting weights and the, you know, the mom's like, I don't think he's old enough. Um, he might get hurt. 
Um, or, you know, hey, well, it doesn't do any good for a 10-year-old or 11-year-old to lift weights anyway. Um, all those things. So you hear also the thing about cardio, like, oh, you know, if you run too much, you're not going to get stronger. You're, you're, you need to lift more weights and then run. And, and that, I feel like that flips every time, too. You know, for a while it was, you got to focus on your cardio, and now there's a big focus on, like, resistance training. And um, it'll probably flip again later on, too. The big thing for weight training, harming bones, I always tell people is, you know, especially in the younger kids with open growth plates, you're, you really want high repetition but low weight. You don't want heavy Olympic lifts. They shouldn't be, you know, maxing out on the, with the, in a squat rack. They shouldn't be maxing out on deadlift or bench press. Um, they really should be doing lighter weights. And that's even really true in, I think, in a lot of junior high settings too because those kids still have open growth plates. I mean, the, the hard part comes into that, you know, freshman, sophomore year of high school when you got that, you know, 14-year-old kid who looks like he's 11, you know, or looks like he's 12, and he's still got open growth plates, but you got the kid next to him, he's got a mustache already. So um, it's just, in, in that you have to really do a lot of uh, coaching to the parents as far as, you know, hey, this is the situation, and that's, you know, unfortunately the way it is. Some kids just mature faster than others, and that's where you get into this, chronological age and biological age. So this little kid's, uh, this little kid's uh, <laughs> biological age must be a whole lot bigger than his chronological age since he's over there lifting weights already. But um, you have to factor in, once again, their baseline fitness level, kind of going back to what Dr. Chorley talked about. You know, you've got the really obese kid who wants to do stuff, but maybe he's just not ready to do it yet. And then also, um, you know, are they able to do some of those motions? You know, some people are just not super coordinated. Maybe they shouldn't be doing um, some of the more advanced things yet. They need to start off, um, you know, crawl before you can walk. And then, um, once again, we go back to making sure they don't have any other medical issues. For this one, you also have to t factor in, once again, the whole, like, listening things. You know, those really severe ADHD kids, uh, you just really need to, to be, be wary of those, especially when they get into junior high and they throw them into a weight room with 40 other kids and t one coach. Um, sometimes it's not a, not a great recipe for success. The other thing you always hear, uh, the other thing that it, that it does occur is that it's really sometimes difficult to increase muscle mass before puberty. So you have to, once again, kind of moderate those expectations with those, those kids, especially, you know, you have the 12-year-old 12 12-year-old 12 male or something, and he's like, I want to, you know, I want to start lifting weights. Well, sure, that's great. You can get stronger, definitely. But you're not going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger just yet. You know, you really need that, that testosterone from puberty to, to, to do that. And also, once again, we go back to proper supervision. And um, definitely those, those really big, uh, those really uncontrolled hypertensive kids, you, you want to encourage them to work out, but maybe not so much heavy resistance training. Once again, you also look at different things. You can lift for strength, for power, for size or hypertrophy, and also for endurance. I tell people a lot of times, you know, you really want to go for, you know, strength and endurance at this age. Once again, start with the more basic stuff. And bodyweight exercises are fine. Push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, dips, lunges, all those things. It's totally okay to do that. You don't have to have expensive equipment and stuff, especially if you're 10, 11, 12. You know, you can do a lot with just that and a chair. You know, you can do dips off of a chair. So performance training, and this can, you know, definitely focus more on the strength and conditioning camps that are so popular these days. Um, but it also goes to, you know, those parents that have their kids in a private coach, and I've got them in a, I had a knee injury the other day of a kid who was in a, you know, a, um, a private football, football lesson. Um, so you just have that very widespread these days. One of the big focuses on a lot of those things is a lot of plyometrics. So it's more power and explosiveness, which is, um, not necessarily a bad thing for these kids to have, but once again, you kind of put them at risk for, for certain types of injuries if they're doing a lot of box jumps and those types of things. Um, the good thing is more neuromuscular training, which is good for a lot of these kids uh, to learn that, that coordination and whatnot. Some of these things, especially depending on the sport, they will also work on core muscles, which are very important for um, just proper biomechanics. There's no clear evidence that it really helps reduce the uh, injury rates, but one, I think we all agree that um, proper biomechanics is, is really, it's really important to have core strength. And so we look at it in almost all of our um, overuse injuries, and we're finding that even with a lot of acute injuries, such as ACL tears and stuff, those non-contact injuries, that it's, it's more prevalent than we, than we thought. Moving on to distance running. So distance running is really common, too, in the, in the advent of, you know, hey, come pay me $60 to run 20, 
26 miles. And uh, but even for kids, it's the same thing, you know, the, especially the, the rock and roll marathon, the traveling marathon is probably one of the big, more popular ones. And there, you can enroll your kids in that. You can go run the Disney marathon and have your kids run in, you know, the, the Disney dash and all those things too. One of the big things we should be asking ourselves, you know, is it, is it even okay to do that? And there's just not a lot of research that's been done on that yet, you know. And um, the AEP stance is really that, you know, as long as the kids enjoy it, it's okay. And that's probably um, a more um, broad stance that should apply to lots of different things. You know, I think that's true for going into any sport or any training program. If the kids aren't having fun, why are we doing it? You know, um, and that's where we get into like burnout, which we'll talk about in a minute too. But they also just need to be aware of the risks of distance running too, and they need to be um, proper training and supervision is really necessary for these two. You can't just start running every day um, or you'll end up coming in and seeing one of us for overuse injuries. Healthychildren.org, I don't know if um, any of you guys use that or not, but it has a lot of good stuff on distance running. And actually I was looking at it the other couple of days ago when I was looking at my, uh, going over my slides again, and there's actually a pretty good um, section on there about strength training too. So that's somewhere you can refer your patients to and it's got, honestly, it's got a lot of the stuff that were in the slides too on there. Um, spelled out real nice and neat for, for parents. Burnout, it's a real problem, it really is, and it's something we all have to be aware of. You know, overtraining syndrome, I'm gonna call it burnout for the, for the remainder of the talk, but technically it's overtraining syndrome. What it is, is these are kind of the symptoms that you'll see. Some of them more severe, um, some of them less. So really it's, your, your just decreased sports performance is probably the biggest one. You're having more, you know, a lot of mood changes, getting tired more often, things of that nature. And uh, they're just like, hey, I don't want to do it. I, I kind of don't want to go to practice. I want to you know, rest. I want to sleep in. I'm sleeping a lot, those kind of things. Um, or I can't sleep. Sometimes you get the other, the other end of the, of the spectrum. And um, they might have other complaints like, oh, I just get random body aches or stomach aches or headaches. Um, they start having a lot of frequent overuse injuries. What you really need to be asking these kids is, you know, how much are you doing? How much are you sleeping? Are you resting in between days of practice? You know, are you in the middle of competition season? Is this the, you know, competitive cheer? Is this competitive cheer season for you and you're working up to that, that big thing? Or do we have any pre-existing anxiety, depression? Do we have any risk factors for that on top of that? And uh, so sometimes you'll need to involve other people with this, you know, athletic trainers, nutritionists, um, or even uh, psychology as well if they're um, having anxiety, depression. Some people advocate working, burnout, working up burnout in this fashion. They'll say, do your basic fatigue things. You know, you kind of have to rule out the badness. Make sure it's not something else before you assume you're just playing too much soccer. So sometimes that might include labs, you know, whatever you guys would normally do. And um, you go from there. And uh, if you just oftentimes we'll rest them for a period of two weeks or so. And hey, if they've come back and they feel better, then, then it's mostly just normal fatigue. And they just need to make some training adjustments. Maybe that means taking a day off here and there. Maybe that means taking a month off here and there rather than playing all year long. And if not improved, then that's definitely something that's much more pathologic and needs to start, you need to start involving that, that team of uh, specialists to help you, whether it be nutritionists, whether it be especially psychology is, um, for these things. I feel like the more I see uh, um, concussions and really any type of injuries, back pain especially, those uh, back pain kiddos, um, you really have to look at that psychological state. Uh, there's just so much tied up into that. There's, there's stuff going on at home, and, and that's where I think you guys are really, you're really key for because oftentimes you're more in tune to that than, you know, us who might see them once, but you've known them, you know, for, for their, their entire lives. And emotion plays a big component, you know. Kids and identities revolve around sport, especially if they get injured or they just don't do well or they, you know, they've always played a sport and they get to high school and all of a sudden they get cut from a team. You know, and now, now what do they do? All their friends are playing basketball, but they're not, you know. Um, and then kind of melds into sports specialization and, you know, the, should we be playing stuff all year long? And I know Scott's talking about that later, so I won't uh, belabor the point on, on that. Really just the unnecessary stress in sports you get a lot, you know, especially you get into more competitive sports. Um, uh, gymnastics probably be the one, being one of the most publicized ones. Um, but there's that you know happens anywhere. Like I said, I mean, go to any, go to any little league game or any you know flag football game or softball game, and you'll see parents screaming and coaches screaming and blood pressures are up and all those kids are out there feeling all that all that pressure, you know. So 
And children quit for a lot of reasons, you know, and especially one, one of the things they, they'll also talk about too is, you know, always be a little wary when, when dad's the coach or, or mom's the coach or, you know, or, or mom was a gymnast or mom was a cheerleader. And, and uh, I see that so much that these kids just get pushed to the point where they just don't want to anymore. And this is kind of the, the s statement from the Council on Sports Medicine and Fitness is that, you know, young athletes should not play one sport more than five days a week. And should have at least two to three months off a year from that sport. And does that actually happen in practice? I feel like, I mean, as sports medicine physicians, we see, uh, um, you know, our, our patient population is a little skewed. So I don't know if I see this a lot. I see kids who, you know, they're doing the same thing all year long, and you're lucky if you get two weeks off at Christmas. But that, maybe that's why they're seeing me, and that probably is. So it's one of the things you can counsel parents when they're starting to put their kids in sports and going down, getting ready to dive down that rabbit hole of just remember they're going to need breaks. Growing bodies need time to, to rest and just be a kid. Once again, set realistic goals and help them, counsel them to do that. And then uh, resistance training is safe if done right. And um, running is safe if done right. And uh, just remember to always keep burnout on your, uh, on your radar when you're dealing with these uh, child athletes. I think that's about it. We're done.